Amen. So you're there in Habakkuk chapter 1, and we, we are continuing through the series of the prophets, and uh, we are obviously going through the minor prophets, and uh, we're in Habakkuk, Habakkuk. So uh, three chapters in here, and uh, there's definitely a lot of cool stuff in here uh, as far as uh, just stuff that's quoted off in the New Testament. Actually, there's going to be a very famous verse that's quoted off in the New Testament that we'll see. Um, but first of all, the thing that I see here is the very first here is, is how this book starts off. Notice what it says in verse 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that rise up, raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeded. So the first thing you see here is that Habakkuk is basically saying, hey, the, the, the law is slacked, judgment is never going forth, and the wrong judgment is what goes forth. And this is very pertinent today. today. You know, when you think of the judgment that goes forth and just how the law is slack and, you know, the law is perverted and, you know, basically the righteous are being uh, condemned and the wicked are being justified. And this is something that there's nothing new under the sun. So when you're thinking about today and you're like, man, it just seems like everything is backwards, the nothing, no right judgments going forth. Listen, Habakkuk was saying the same thing. Okay, so this is, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, but, you know, Habakkuk is obviously a prophet, and he's saying this because there's a lot of stuff going on and nothing's happening. And you can understand his mindset as far as the fact of, you know, how long is this going to be until judgment comes forth. I don't believe he's saying, like, it's never going to come forth. I think he's just basically saying, hey, this needs, you know, when's this going to be taken care of? When is the judgment going to come forth? Go to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, because the wicked are saying, where is the God of judgment? Okay, so Habakkuk's not saying here, like, there is no God of judgment. Ju you know, judgment's never going to come forth. He's basically just pointing out the fact that good judgment, you know, basically wrong judgment proceeded. Uh, judgment doth not go, it never goes forth. And he's just stating what's going on, and he's, he's upset about it. Okay, so you can understand where he's coming from. And understand that this is the same kind of grievance we have, right? As far as what's going on in our world and the fact that righteous people are being oppressed and wicked people are being exalted and just how backwards that is. Um, but the wicked are saying this. In Malachi chapter 2 and verse 17, it says this. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or, where is the God of judgment? Okay. So you can kind of see both sides here. Habakkuk is saying, listen, judgment, right judgment is not going forth. Wrong ju judgment is going forth. The, the law is slack. You know, how long? You know, it's kind of like, how long until this is going to be righted? And the wicked are saying, you know, that, that the evil are good, and the good are evil. And the fact that, where is this God of judgment you speak of? Right? You're talking about this God of judgment that's going to come down. An American is saying this today when we keep preaching the fact that God is going to judge the wickedness that's in our nation when it comes to sodomy, when it comes to fornication, when it comes to adultery, when it comes to murder, when it comes to shedding innocent blood. And we're saying that the hammer of God's coming down and they're saying, where is the God of judgment? See, we're saying, you know, the law is slack and you know, judgment, wrong judgment proceeded and judgment doesn't go forth, and we're just, we're just we're, we're like, man, when is this going to be fixed, and how are we going to get through this? And the wicked are saying, where is this God of judgment you speak of? Right? It's just kind of like, where is this guy? You know? And they're calling evil, they're saying, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. That's what the world we live in today. It's like reading a newspaper. Okay? Now go to Psalm 58, because I want to give you some. So Habakkuk's kind of bringing this up like, hey, you know, this is the state we're in. It's not a very uh, uplifting, uh, he's, he's pretty much complaining about what's going on, okay? And David does this a lot, too. I, I think of Habakkuk of, of more like a psalm, okay? You'll see that the, the third chapter is pretty much a psalm, okay? It's the prayer of Habakkuk, and he basically ends the whole book with uh, that he's given this to his, uh, 
his musicians on the stringed instruments, instruments if I can speak right. Um, so uh, you can definitely see how this is very much like the Psalms, only later on, obviously, down the line. Because Habakkuk is, is uh, before the Babylonian captivity, um, but way after David. Okay. Now, in Psalm 58, dealing with this judgment, or the God of judgment, listen, it's coming. And we're, right now, we're kind of like Habakkuk. We're like, the law is slack, and you know, judgment doth never go forth. And when judgment does go forth, it's the wrong judgment, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, by the time they finally do judgment, they, they come to the wrong conclusions. And they're, they're, they're basically condemning the just and exalting the wicked. And everything is just basically evil is good, good is evil, bitter sweet, sweet is bitter, light is darkness, darkness is light. And Isaiah talked about it. Habakkuk's talking about it. And guess what? It's still going on today. Okay. And so this is very pertinent. And this kind of prayer that Habakkuk's saying, I'm just like, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> you're reading this, you're like, yeah, I feel you. I feel your pain. And, but Psalm 58, read this in this mindset of, you know, the fact that the wicked are saying, where is this God of judgment? You know, where is the God of judgment? And us as believers are saying, you know, how long is this going to go on? That judgment doesn't go forth. And in verse 6, uh, so Psalm 58 verse 6 says break their teeth O God in their mouth break out the great teeth of the young lions O Lord let them melt away as waters which run continually when he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows let them be cu as cut in pieces as a snail which melteth let every one of them pass away like the untimely birth of a woman that they may not see the sun before your spots can feel the thorn or I'm sorry before your pots can feel the thorns he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Listen, it's common, okay? And you can say the fact that, uh, you know, like, well, you know, why are you tearing? Why is this going on? And, 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 uh, and then you could even look at this and be like, man, that seems a little harsh. You know, you're going to be washing your feet in the blood of the wicked. But when you think about pedophiles, you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be rejoicing to see their judgment. Anybody that would hurt a child and shed innocent blood like that, you know what? I'll be rejoicing in that day. Okay? And those same people are saying, where is this God of judgment? And everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And these people that are just blaspheming God and just saying, you know, it's not coming. There is no God of judgment. And, you know, obviously the world is saying today that God doesn't judge anybody. We shouldn't judge anybody. Even though the Bible obviously talks about him being the judge, okay? The judge, the lawgiver, the king. But also the fact is, is that we're supposed to judge our neighbor righteously. We're supposed to judge with righteous judgment, and there's nothing wrong with judging if you're judging with righteous judgment. You're just not supposed to be a hypocritical judge. Uh, you know, judge. But uh, going on in Habakkuk there, so you know, it starts off with this, and you can, it's very relatable. You're just like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, this is exactly what's going on. And in, in Habakkuk chapter one and verse five, there's this warning that's given. Basically, like if this stuff continues, judgment's coming. And this warning is given here that God is going to work a work. You know, if, if you continue down this path, notice what it says in verse 5. It says, Behold, ye are among the heathen. Ye, I'm sorry, behold, ye among the heathen, and regard, wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Okay. So if you're dealing with Judah or the nation of Israel, but I believe particularly dealing with Judah because we're talking about the Chaldeans taking them out. Okay. And this also shows you that we're before the Babylonian captivity because you're talking about the Chaldeans doing this in the future. Okay. And Go to Acts chapter 13 because that place where it says, For I will work a work in your days which ye shall will not believe, though it be told you, this is actually quoted in Acts chapter 13. Okay? 
And I, I believe Habakkuk will give you more information as far as why is he say, saying this, you know? Like, why is he mentioning this in Acts 13? Because he's giving them a warning in verse 13 and verse 40. I'm sorry, Acts 13, verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. So when you first read it, you're like, what are you talking about? You know, you're going to work this work, like, what's going on? Well, when you go back to Habakkuk, what's it talking about? The Chaldeans coming in and taking you out. Okay? Now, obviously, it doesn't quote that part because the Chaldeans are already long gone. Okay? So it kind of wouldn't make sense to quote about what had already happened. But as you're going back there, and you think about this. If you're dealing with uh, Judah or Jerusalem in that day, Who's the Babylon in that day? Rome. And doesn't Rome end up taking them out? You know, destroying the city, destroying the temple. And obviously Jesus prophesied of that and said, hey, not one stone is going to be left upon another. And so that definitely happened. But, you know, you can see how that would relate to Babylon. Okay. But, you know, you, you see that. You know, I work, work. What's this work that you're working? Okay. Well, in Habakkuk, it says, For, lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. Okay? So the work that he's working is he's raising up this nation to destroy them. Okay? So it gives you insight as far as, like, well, what's this warning? Why are you telling me to beware and that you're going to work this work? But it also shows you that that passage, I will work a work in your days, a work which you shall no, no wise believe, that that has a lot, it has dual meaning, meaning that it obviously applied to them when the Chaldeans did take them out. Right? It all obviously applied in the day in Acts chapter 13 where he sa- he's warning them, saying, hey, I'll work a work in your day. You know, in the day of, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul and when Jerusalem and, 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 uh, and Judah was, uh, Judea was taken out by Titus, right? The, the Roman emperor. And guess what? That's going to apply in the end as well. Okay, so... You know, there's a lot of uh, dual meanings there or multiple meanings or just, I guess, multiple applications of the same thing that's going to be happening over and over again, right? Um, But, you know, this shows you that we're before the Babylonian captivity, which makes sense because Zephaniah, if you go to Zephaniah, so the next book, here's how I remember, and you have different ways of remembering the books of the Bible, but always remember when you get into the minor prophets, those are probably the harder ones to remember, is... um, you know, you kind of just go through the list, you know, like Jonah, Mike, and Nahum, you know, and I don't know why, but that just kind of flows to me. But then I'm thinking H-Z-H-Z. Okay, so this is how I remember it. You know, there's an H, there's a Z, there's an H and a Z. I know Zechariah is at the end, okay, and obviously at Malachi at the end, at the very end. But I always think Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. So that's how I remember it, okay? Um, it has nothing to do with this sermon. That just has to do with how I remember where these, where these are at, okay? But I just remember HZ, HZ, and then obviously Zephaniah comes before Zechariah because Zechariah is kind of the end of the Bible. So um, anyway, if that helps you out, great. If I confused you and made it worse for you, I'm sorry. But in Zephaniah 1 and verse 1, so that's the next book, okay? The whole point I'm making is right after Habakkuk, you have Zephaniah, Okay. Verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So Josiah, you know, died before the Babylonian captivity. It was his sons that dealt with this whole Babylonian captivity. Okay, so it makes sense that Habakkuk would be before the Babylonian captivity. Okay, like I said, I believe all the minor prophets are in chronological order. Okay. And, you know, it, it, this makes sense. Okay. So I just want to point that out and show you the silly way in which I remember the books of the Bible. But um, go to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. So I'm kind of just going through the book of Habakkuk, and there are certain things that pop out to me um, about this prophet. One, that it is kind of like a psalm, and especially the last chapter is, is like a psalm. Uh, It's called a prayer, but a lot of times the Psalms are like prayers too. Um, But you kind of have that aspect of kind of like David writing down something. Um, Habakkuk 2 and verse 1 here. It says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower 
and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. So I love this because Habakkuk is realizing, hey, I'm complaining about this, you know, that this stuff's going on. And he's just like, I'm just going to wait for the answer and when he reproves me, right? Because he's kind of like looking at this, like, I know the answer is going to be a reproof, you know, and the fact that, you know, he's God, he knows what's going on. It's not like he's asleep, right? Because the end of uh, Habakkuk 1, he's kind of like, aren't thou from everlasting, O Lord? And, and he's kind of que- questioning, but he also knows in the back of his mind the answer to the question. So he's kind of like complaining about this. He's like, aren't thou from everlasting? You, you're... You're, you can't look upon iniquity, but yet this stuff is going on. And then he's saying, I'm just going to wait here and wait for an answer and for you to reprove me. <laughs> so he's like already knows that like there's going to be a reproof in the fact that, hey, you know, he knows what's up. You know, like God knows what's going on. He's not asleep at the wheel. He knows, you know, that this stuff's going forth and, you know, he, he knows how to deal with it. But the next thing that I love here is in verse 2. It says, and the Lord answered me. So this is the answer, and he, and he said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now, before we get into his answer, I love this. I love the fact that God is answering and saying, listen, write this vision, make it plain, okay, that he may run that read it. So what does this mean? Meaning that you need to make it very simple and plain, clear as day of what you're saying this vision is, so that whoever hears this can just hit the ground running, okay? I've heard people say this as far as like, make it like really clear so that if you're running, you can see it kind of thing, but I don't think that's what it's saying, okay? I don't think it's like a speed limit sign. You gotta make it really big so that you're going so fast, you can see it real quick, you know? I think it's basically stating that, make it so clear that you can hit the ground running, right? There's no hesitation. It's just like, boom, let's do this, right? It's just crystal clear. In some other verses on this, you know, we're talking about this vision, okay? You need to make the vision clear, plain, so that you can just hit the ground running. You know, that's essentially the way I would explain this verse is it needs to be plain and clear, hit the ground running with this vision. The Bible says, go to, go to Nahum chapter 8, Nahum chapter 8, not Nahum, Nehemiah. I don't know how many times I've done that. <laughs> Nehemiah, it starts with an N. So Nehemiah, you're going to Nehemiah chapter 8. I'm going to read to you Proverbs 29 and verse 18. It says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Listen, that vision better be according to the law. Okay? We're not having these heavenly visions of Mary in a cloud somewhere, or you saw a vision of Mary in your uh, Cheerios. No, this better be according to the law. Okay? You have a vision from God. It better be, thus saith the Lord. This is what you're supposed to do. Okay? Now, that being said, it needs to be plain. So that he that heareth it will run when he hears it. Okay, he's just hitting the ground running. Nahum chapter 8, I love this verse right here. Because this really tells you what a preacher should be. You know, why do I preach, right? Because you all have the Holy Ghost inside of you, right? The same anointing that I have, you have. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing, Teacheth, teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. So you don't technically need me to preach to you for you to understand the Bible, right? But what's the point of preaching, okay? Why do I preach to you? Is it just to make, you, make it look like I'm smart, you know? Just to make it look like I have a lot of clout, that I have a lot of knowledge in the Bible? Is it just all for show? Or is there a reason why I'm preaching, okay? Notice what it says in Nahum chapter 8 and verse 8. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. Okay? So if it was just about reading the Bible, preaching was just about reading the Bible, we'd just read the Bible and go home. Right? Well, let's get up here. Anna, Anna, turn around now and be quiet. If it's just about reading the Bible, we would just have to take turns reading the Bible up here. Okay? The point of preaching is that so that it makes sense, okay? It makes sense. There's some really hard passages. All right, you know what my job is? To unpack that for you and have it make sense, okay? So that you understand what you're reading, okay? When you go out soul winning, what's the point? Understand this without readest? How can I except some man should guide me, 
You know what you are? You're a preacher. Because how shall they hear, you know, except, or how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach except to be sent? You know what? You are, your purpose out soul winning is to give the sense and give the understanding. Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. But as a preacher, you know, what would be the point of me just reading you a hard passage? You'd be like, all right, it's hard. See you guys. Figure it out later. Figure it out on your own. Now, my job is to, to have it make sense for you. Okay? And your job is to judge whether that's right or not. Okay? You have the Holy Ghost inside of you, and you can understand uh, what's going on there. But my job as a preacher is to take hard passages, to take things that are in the Bible that are doctrines, and to unpack it. Unpack it and so that it'll make sense and so that you understand it. But if I have a vision and it's not clear what that vision is, how can you run when you hear it? You know what our vision here at Mountain Baptist Church is? See as many people saved as possible. You know what? You can hit the ground running on that one, can't you? You'd be like, what do I need to do? Go find someone to get them saved, <laughs> right? Run, do it. And, you know, when it comes to any types of other things that we do in the church, when it comes to doctrines, reading, uh, Bible memorization, you know, there's a clear vision as far as what we're supposed to be doing. And, you know, when it comes to doctrines, it needs to be clear. Listen, if, if, you, if someone preaches a doctrine and it's as clear as mud, after you get done with them, uh, you know, talking about it, there's something wrong with that. Okay? Doctrines in the Bible should be crystal clear. It should be very simple at its core with complex things around it. Okay? You know, any doctrine I've ever preached is very simple. Even end times, you say, well, the end times is pretty complex. Yeah, there's some complex things that are said within end times, and some you get into the weeds and all this stuff. Anna, turn around now. Come up here. Come up to the front. Now. Come up to the front and sit up front. The end, time, end times prophecy has a lot. Sit up front, right there by the, by the hymnals. Sit right there and look at me. Look at me. Don't look at the people behind you. Don't be distracting. End times prophecy has a lot of complexity to it, but at the core, you know what end times prophecy is? We're going to go through tribulation. Jesus is coming. He's going to rapture us out, and he's going to pour out his wrath on everybody else. Very simple to the core. That's plain. All right, now fill that in with all the complexities of the timelines, the abomination desolation, you know, all the trumpets and vials and what's going on during that, you know, the, the Babylon and all that. But very simple to the core. Tribulation, rapture, wrath. Boom. All right, now fill it in. When it comes to anything else in the Bible, when it comes to doctrines, it should be very simple to the core. Even a very complex passage should be very simple to the core. Okay? Even if you were to talk about, you know, where unto even baptism does also now save us. And you get into this whole thing with Noah and the flood and everything. Here's very simple to the core. Baptism saves us because we're saved by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Boom, there it is. Now let me explain to you why that all makes sense with that passage. Okay, very plain, very simple. And the problem is in churches today, they're too vague. They're vague on everything because they don't want to actually be accountable for preaching something wrong. They're vague because if you come back and be like, I think you're wrong, and be like, well, I didn't really say, you know, that I stood on that, you know. And here's the thing. We all make mistakes, and we're all going to have, I'm going to have, I'm sure I'm going to have times where I'm going to be like, yeah, I was actually wrong about that one thing right there. But you know, you know why people are vague a lot of times? Because they're too lazy to actually do the study and make sure that that's exactly what it is, okay? And they don't want to do their due diligence, or they're too afraid that they're wrong on something. But listen, if you can't get your doctrine down and make it simple, then maybe you shouldn't be a preacher. Okay? But, you know, when it comes to doctrines, you've got to put it through the fire because the, in order for it to be plain, you have to really understand it. You have to know every ins and out of it. To make it very simple, you have to know all the ins and outs so that you know that making it that simple, you have to make sure everything else fits. Okay? And so... Uh, that's the type of preaching we need today. Go to uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. 
So I love that verse, you know, write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. So the vision that you have should be very plain and simple so that he may run that read it. I mean, when it comes to salvation, isn't it simple? The simplicity that's in Christ. You explain that to somebody, they can run when they read that. Like, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be like, I want that. Let's do that. Now. Now's the accepted time. Now's the day of salvation. Let's take that cup of salvation. You know, you're not, you're not like foggy about what needs to happen. <laughs> okay. Now, in uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3, a very famous verse, for, and a verse that's brought up a few times in the New Testament. It says in verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, this is a, the just shall live by faith is a very you know, well-known verse saying in the New Testament. It's actually mentioned three times. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And Hebrews chapter 10 is really uh, the one place where it actually quotes a little more than that, okay, from Habakkuk. Okay, so you'll see something that's very similar in the wording. So Hebrews chapter 10. And I want you to notice that it says in Habakkuk chapter 2, but the just shall live by his faith. The antecedent to his is the just. Okay, and you say, what's the point of it? What, what are you saying? Okay, of course, it's his faith that he saved. Yeah, we'll say that to a Calvinist. Okay, because a Calvinist will say that that's not really your faith, that's God's faith. He's the one believing for you, not you. Okay, you are too totally depraved to believe. So, but when it says his faith, it's talking about the just's faith. The just shall live by his faith. So, it's your personal faith that you're putting in to Jesus. It's your personal faith that's saving you, okay? That's justifying you. And Habakkuk is hitting the nail on the head right there. And so, you know, the Calvinists are going to just quote off, the just shall live by faith. And they're going to say, well, that's God's faith. That's the faith that he's getting. That's the, the gift of God, which is faith, which is just garbage. I mean, it's just completely not what the Bible says on that. Faith is the personal action, you know, that you have to take to believe. That's the one requirement is believing. Okay. Now, in Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 35, it says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have, not, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the, uh, receive the promise. So he's basically stating that, listen, you need to uh, go to the end. You know, if, if, uh, if we continue on to the end, the confidence and all this stuff, we're going to have a great recompense of reward. There's going to be rewards for living for Christ. Notice verse 37. Anna, Anna. Shh. Verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Sound familiar? Because it says something similar to that in Habakkuk chapter 2 when it says, Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So it's, it's calling back a little more to Habakkuk than the other passage that we're going to see later on. It says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, a lot of people take this passage here in Hebrews chapter 10 and say, well, see, you can draw back and lose your salvation. <laughs> no. If you look at Habakkuk, there's a contrast in Habakkuk. Okay? Go back to Habakkuk chapter 2. There's a contrast. It's not saying... Someone's a believer, and they, they drew back unto being an unbeliever. That's what they want you to think, okay? It doesn't say that in Hebrews 10, and it definitely doesn't say that in Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2 says this in verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Does that sound like a believer that stopped believing or a believer that drew back? Does that sound like anything like that, okay? So when it's talking about him that draweth back, it's talking about a soul that's lifted up. Okay, now let's look at Romans 1 because Romans 1 is another place where this is brought up. And there's another dichotomy you'll see there. See, Habakkuk chapter 2 gives you the dichotomy of a soul that's lifted up in him is not going to be justified, right? It says uh, a soul that's lifted up is not upright in him. That's the one side, but the just shall live by his faith. So the dichotomy of those two people, right? The soul of him that's lifted up in him is not upright in him, but then the just shall live by his faith. 
in Hebrews chapter 10, it's saying the just shall live by his faith, but if any man draw back, right, unto perdition, you know, we are not of them to draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. So there's another dichotomy. Well, who's this person that draws back under perdition? Okay? And you're like in Romans 1, you're like, I wonder where you're going with this. <laughs> but look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, unto, um, unto uh, salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Who's the dichotomy here? The just shall live by faith, but the wrath of God is revealed on those that hold the truth in unrighteousness, those that draw back unto perdition. Who are those that draw back unto perdition? But those who have been given over to a reprobate mind. Okay? And you know what Paul says? My soul shall have no pleasure in them. Okay? So when you're looking at Hebrews chapter 10, you're not dealing with an unsaved person or a saved person drawing back. Does that make sense? You're dealing with a saved person that's justified by faith and someone that's drawing back unto perdition. Okay? And Habakkuk even gives you that same thing that's saying, you're dealing with a saved person that's justified by his faith, but you're also dealing with this unsaved person or this reprobate that's lifted up in himself. And what's one of the main attributes of a reprobate? Pride. And obviously it goes on with that in the back of chapter 2. And just to give you for good measure, the other place where this is mentioned, go to Galatians chapter 3. So there's three places that this is quoted in the New Testament. Hebrews 10, Romans 1, and Galatians 3. And... When it says the just shall live by faith, guess what? That means it's not by works. And if you, if you question that, go to Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> okay, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. For as many as are for the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Why is it evident? For the just shall live by faith. That's why you're not justified by the law. Because it's written, the just shall live by faith. It says, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So good luck with that. Okay, you want to live in the law? Good luck. But you got to, you know, curse is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But it says this, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So it's very clear that when it says just shall live by faith, you know what it, mean, what it means by that? It's not by works. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. But the him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You know, when Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto righteousness, you know what it says about that? It's saying that he didn't work at all. Okay? You know what it says? The just shall live by faith. You know what they're saying? It's not by the deeds of the law. It's evident. If the just shall live by faith, it's not by works. So Habakkuk is where that comes from. It's interesting, right? Where you see these phrases that are very popular New Testament phrases. The just shall live by faith. You'd be like, well, where's that at? Isaiah? You know, is that in Genesis? Like, where's this at? Habakkuk. <laughs> right? And in uh, other places, you're like, love, the, love thy neighbor as thyself. It's got to be in Psalms, right? It's got to be the sweet psalmist of Israel is the one that said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus 19. Ouch! Man, that one hurts, doesn't it? Leviticus 19 is like this spiritual sandwich between 18 and 20. <laughs> right? Sodomites are an abomination. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Sodomites should be put to death. Ah, it's like, ah, what should I do, you know? It's like that button, you know, that guy that's like sweating, and there's like a button. Leviticus is Old Testament. Don't, you should love thy neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, love thy neighbor as yourself, you know. Which one do you push, right? So anyway, uh, but it's interesting sometimes where, you know, these very famous passages come up, and you would think the just, the just shall live by faith would be in like a more popular, like, book where everybody knows, like, Psalms and Proverbs, right? It's got to be in there somewhere, you know, they, they attach it to the New Testament, the Gideon New Testament, right? But it's actually in Habakkuk, so. Um, 
But going on, go to Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 10. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 10 here. Very interesting uh, uh, verse here. Okay. It says here in Habakkuk 2 and verse 10, Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people, and hast sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. This is a very interesting verse, okay? And I'm just going to kind of talk to you about what I think this may be talking about. But it's talking about that basically the house is established by shame and basically murdering people, like cutting off many people, okay? And it says, you know, that by the shedding, you know, basically it says, uh, woe to him that buildeth a town with blood. Okay, so you're cutting off many pe people and you're building this town by basically bloodshed, okay? And it's stating that the stone of the wall is going to cry out to the beam of the timber. And it's interesting how there's a lot of, like, uh, I want to say supernatural, you know, paranormal activity that people find around, like, places that had a lot of horrible, wicked things happen, okay? Now, bear with me on this. I'm not a ghost hunter, okay? I don't, I don't believe in ghosts, okay? But I do believe in devils. Okay? And it's interesting where devils hang out. Okay? And you're like, they hang out somewhere? Well, look at Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. There's actually a habitation, you know, for devils. Now, you think about these like places where it's like some psych ward and or some like just place where there's a lot of wickedness happened, a lot of people died, or things like that. And people are saying, you know, like I heard voices, I heard certain things that are going on. Listen, there is a supernatural world out there, okay? There are necromancers. There are people that talk with the dead. Now, when they talk with the dead, they're talking to devils, okay? And I still remember this story where I was, uh, you know, I was out soul winning, and this girl, this young, like, teenage girl uh, was saying that, you know, she has a Ouija board, and they're basically telling her that hell is good, and they want her to be there with them. And I'm like, I'm like, no. You know, basically... The devil, I, I believe it was demons, you know, you're dealing with devils that are trying to, and if you don't think that realm exists, what are all these people being possessed with devils in the Bible, okay? And that is after the resurrection as well that this is going on, and I'm going to show you Revelation 18, it talks about that this place is going to be a habitation of devils, okay? And they're talking about Babylon, okay? The great city Babylon. Eight, Revelation chapter 18, verse 20, it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So, when this wicked place is destroyed, it's almost like there, it's just left with a bunch of devils, you know, a bunch of evil spirits and unclean spirits that are there, and, and listen, I'm just, I'm just speaking right now. I'm not saying, like, this is exactly what this verse is saying. But I'll say this. There, are, there is going to be a habitation of devils in a very wicked place that was built on bloodshed, okay, Babylon. And that when, when you have these places and, and people are like, well, I know, I heard that voice. I saw this. I saw that. Listen, there is a, there is a, a you know, a spiritual realm out there, Okay. I don't believe it's your dead cousin, though, okay? If, if people die, the only people that are going to come back are saved people, okay? And the Bible does talk about people coming back, but they weren't like just uh, specters, like Casper the Friendly Ghost, okay? When they come back in the Bible, they come back in a body, right? And they're showing up like as an old man, like, like Samuel, or it talks about after Jesus was risen from the dead, it says many of the, bo the, saint, the bodies of the saints came up out of the graves, and went into the city for a witness, okay? They didn't just, like, like ghouls coming out of the, the graves, and you're just like, oh, you know, they're, <laughs> I'm your great-grandfather, you know. It's not going on, okay? But there is, there are devils. There are wicked, and so when people are saying, hey, I'm talking to someone from the dead, Listen, necromancy's talked about in the Bible. That's, ta that's talking about speaking to the dead. Okay, that's like the breakdown of the word, okay? And, but they're not dealing with 
like dead people that are in hell, like, you know, those people are down there, okay? They're not coming back up. They're not visiting people, you know, or anything like that. You're dealing with devils, okay? You're dealing with a spiritual realm of devils. And, you know, it's very possible that that's why you have a lot of paranormal activity in very wicked places where people were murdered or things like that, okay? And you know what? A lot of times when stuff like that happens, you know what they do? They tear down the building. There was a case uh, in Clarksburg, uh, and there was this Hardee's. It made national news, but just very violent murder that happened in this Hardee's. Okay? You know what they did? They tore down the building. Now there's a bank there. So there's a bunch of usury going. I mean, usury going. No, I'm just kidding. But there is a bank there. Okay? So they built something in that area. Okay? But there's no more Hardee's. That building's gone. You know why? Because no one wanted to be in that building, right? You know, there's jokes. You're like, come and get your, uh, your murder burger with your homicide of fries. You know, but who's going to go there and get that, right? You know, like, who's going to go back to that place? But all, that, all joking aside, obviously, it's not a joking matter what happened there. But, you know, there may be some truth to that as far as the, the stone crying out and all this. And as far as, like, the sin that's being attached to this building, okay? And how that even applies to to Babylon. So don't take me too far on that. People are going to be like, oh, Pastor Robinson is over here talking about ghosts. He's going to go hunt ghosts. I never said that. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying that devils are real and that they do, they are still around us and that they have habitations that they hang out in. Okay, so that's just Bible. Okay, so, um, but uh, go back to Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15. So I'm just pointing out some interesting things that I see in Habakkuk. Um, you're like, you're all over the place. Well, I'm just reading through Habakkuk here. So this isn't a chapter, this isn't a verse by verse. I can't go through every little point here. That'll be for future sermons when we actually go through the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth the, thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So here's another verse that's, that's showing you that, hey, it's not a... It's not a good thing to give your neighbor drink. Now, there's two things dealing with here. First of all, it's just giving your neighbor drink. And it's interesting in the, in the don't worry about it, Anna. We'll get it later. We'll fix it later. Um, is that in America today, that's like the thing like, hey, Bob, come over here. I got a beer for you. Let's hang out in our garage. It's like the Bible's like literally saying, woe unto him to give his neighbor drink. And literally, that's like the mentality of like neighborhoods. You know, like, we're mowing grass, and you're like, oh, hey, 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 Jim, come over here, have a beer with me, we'll just sit out here in the lawn chair and talk. You know, and this is like this, you know, that's like America, right? Beer, football, and chips, or whatever, I don't know. Um, but do you see how that's, like, completely contrary to what the Bible says? You're not supposed to be giving your neighbor drink. But on top of that, it goes a little further than that, okay? Notice what it says there. In verse 15, it says, That puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So now you're getting into even more debauchery, where someone would make someone drink so that they'll see their nakedness. Now this is actually interesting because you're dealing with men and men. Right? And that goes on in America. But even so, if you're not dealing with men, you know, if you just deal with the fact of, uh, you know, woe unto him that tarrieth long after the wine, you know, and, and, and all that when it's dealing with alcohol, is that your eyes will behold strange women. And alcohol will make you do stupid things, make you say stupid things, and you'll behold things that you shouldn't be beholding. And, you know, the Bible is basically condemning that here and saying that, hey, alcohol will take you way further than you want to go. The sodomites will use that to defile people. They'll use drugs and alcohol. You know, Hollywood, I mean, they should have a textbook on this because that's what they do, you know. Just drug people and abuse them and all that, okay. So, you know what, you know how you get away from that? Don't take a drink from Bob, you know. Don't take a drink from, from uh, you know, Phil down the road that's just your neighbor, okay. Start with that and you won't get into the other stuff, okay. Go to uh, Habakkuk chapter 3. I was going to get into the dumb idols just because I love that it calls it dumb idols. <laughs> but for sake of time, you know, it basically just talks about these dumb idols that can't speak or talk or, you know, um, and how, you know, but the, it says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. 
let all the earth keep silence before him. So it's basically just showing you that dichotomy of these, these idols, they can't speak, they can't talk, they're not alive, but the Lord is alive, he's in his temple, and you need to keep silence before him. You know, and it just shows you that, that stark difference between the gods of this world and the true God. But in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 13, this is a great verse. Okay? Verse 13, it says, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed, Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. Now, I'm reading this, and hopefully you're seeing something here, of what this represents. Okay? First of all, it's saying that thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. We're talking about God. And it says, even for salvation with thine anointed. What's another word for anointed? Christ, Messiah, right? So in Psalm 2, it talks about against his anointed, and the New Testament says against his Christ. So you're dealing with the Christ. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. What is this referring to? Well, go back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. This is not a coincidence. This is clearly, I believe, talking about Jesus bringing us salvation, and how is he doing it? Notice what it says in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What does it say in Habakkuk? It says that thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation with thine anointed, or the, thine, thy Christ, right? Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. What are you dealing with? You're dealing with wounding the head, bruising the head of the serpent. Anna, close the book, look up here, and stop being distracted. You're distracting everybody, okay? Look at me. So, uh, it, it's very clearly, I believe, calling back to Genesis. This is the first mention of salvation. You know, like, this is right after the fall of man. And he's basically giving the judgment upon the man, upon the woman, and then upon the serpent. And he says to the serpent that it shall bruise thy head. What? Her seed, which is the virgin birth. You're dealing with the fact that he's going to be born of a woman and that Christ is going to bruise his head. Head and Habakkuk says, Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. So they were talking about salvation that's being brought by Jesus by bruising the head of Satan. Okay, and obviously, you know, you're dealing with uh, that he might be manifested to destroy the works of the devil and all these different things. He's the accuser of the brethren, he is the prosecutor in the courtroom, and he's destroying him. He's destroying the prosecution is what he's doing. Now, uh, I think that's a great verse there to just show you, you know, just uh, how that goes all the way back to Genesis, shows you what's going to happen in the future with when Jesus comes and how he's going to destroy the works of the devil. And go back. And then the last thing I want to show you here is in Habakkuk 3 and verse 17, how this book ends. I love this because it starts off with this complaint, you know, and we can all relate, Okay. We're all there with you, Habakkuk. <laughs> right? Wrong judgment goeth forth. No right judgment goeth, you know, is, is proceeding. Like, you're just like, yeah, exactly what he said, you know? And so you can completely understand what he's saying. Then he's saying, you know, I'm just going to wait here until I'm reproved by him. And he tells me what's up. And he ends the book like this. I love this. Verse 17. It says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the, in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon mine own places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. 
So he's like, after all this, he's just like, you know what? Take away everything. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to have joy in the God of my salvation. That's the attitude we should have. And listen, we know that he, we've never seen the, the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread, right? We know these, these truths. All things work together to good for them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We know these promises that he will take care of us and, and all that. But he's saying, although everything fails, although there's just no food, there's no fruit, there's no meat, you know what? I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to have joy in the God of my salvation. That's how he ends it. And that's the way we should, if you think about, if you're going into a prayer, okay, the prayer usually starts off with like, Lord, I got a lot, I got a lot of problems, <laughs> right? Let me lay out everything, right? And the Bible says to cast all your care upon him for he careth for you. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, lay it all out. You don't have to be a politician with God, okay? And try to like, we, no, just be like, Lord, I'm struggling with this. I'm dealing with this. I need help. And you can think about verses, obviously, as you're going through there. But listen, God doesn't expect you to just be like, have this facade when you're praying with him. Just, just let it out. You know, let out how you're feeling with the Lord and just you know, show him your grievances. But in the end, it should be, you know what? If everything falls apart, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to have joy in the God of my salvation. And you know, just, just the, the strength that you have in that. Does that last verse sound familiar? Because that verse is what David said in 2 Samuel chapter 22 and in Psalm 18. In 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 33, it says, God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon my high places. Like I said, it kind of sounds like a psalm in some of these cases, and you're seeing that where he's, he's pulling that. But here's the thing, it's God's word, Okay. You can't say, well, he, he plagiarized from David. It's like, it's God's word. You know what? David was moved by the Holy Ghost to pen that. Okay, so you can't say, well, those are David's words. No, those are God's words. And Habakkuk is saying the same thing. Okay, why? Because it's God's word, and it applies to him just as much as it applied to David. And guess what? It still it applies to us, too. And so I love how Habakkuk ends, because it ends on this high note. If the world falls apart, if everything fails... I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to join the God of my salvation. Because listen, if we all died right now, guess what? We're going to heaven. Okay? If everything falls apart in this world, judgment's not going forth, but you know what? I'm going to rejoice in my God. I'm going to join the God of my salvation. Why? Because he's going to make my, hand, my feet like hinds feet. What is that? It's like, it's like a doe, okay? Meaning that you're going to be really swift, you know? And, uh, and you know what? My strength is in the Lord. God is my strength. You know what? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, who condemneth? It is he that justifieth. And so we need to just rest in the Lord and have that peace that passes understanding because we, it's easy to get depressed of what's going on in the world. And Habakkuk's kind of showing you that at the beginning. It's kind of very depressing, isn't it? It's like, Lord, where are you at? Why aren't you doing this? And then he's just like, all right, just answer me and give me my reproof. <laughs> And at the end, he's, he's just like, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and, you know, joy in the God of my salvation. And that's how we should uh, be in our lives. We are not to be these uh, austere, um, you know, Christians that are just hating life, you know, and just, just down about everything. And just be like, people are going to hell and you're just depressed and down about it. Listen, we should be the most joyful people on this planet. That doesn't mean we don't get upset about sin. But listen, I'm not the one that's going to be judged for all that wickedness that's being done. So why am I worried? Why am I going to be depressed over, over what they're doing? I'm going to put it on the Lord, rest in his strength. And you know what? If the world just falls apart, I'm just going to stand here and watch the show. I'm going to do everything that God tells me to do. Okay? And I'm going to have compassion and make a, di you know, make a difference and, you know, save some with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. But, you know what? I'm not going to let them bring me down. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to have joy in the God of my salvation. And you know what? They're going to be judged. And we're going to be the ones that are going to be rejoicing when they're judged. So that's not with a word of prayer to Heavenly Father. We thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And thank you for the book of Habakkuk. And just help us to 
use uh, the lessons and everything that's taught in Habakkuk to apply them to our lives. We thank you for all everybody that got, that got saved today and this past week, and just pray that you'd bless them and just help them to, to, to see the need to be in church, to get baptized and all that. Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us throughout this week. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.